I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Ed Sausfield as our next lecturer. Dr. Sausfield is currently Clinical Professor of Medicine and Adjunct Professor of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics at the University of Maryland. Prior to joining the University of Maryland in 2004, Dr. Sausfield was Associate Director of the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sausville earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from Manhattan College, an MD-PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He completed internal medicine training at Brigham and Women's Hospital and fellowship in medical oncology from the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sausville's research focus has been on early phase clinical trials of novel anti-cancer therapeutics and the screening and preclinical evaluation of those drugs. Please enjoy today's lecture. Good day. My name is Ed Sausville, and I'm happy to be talking to you today about an overview of the drug discovery process. I'm on the faculty of uh, medicine and pharmacology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. So on an overview of our presentation today, we will be having first a general introduction to the topic, and then over the next uh, hour or so, discuss the definition of drug targets, how we generate diversity for screening molecules as potential drug candidates, the definition of lead structures, and then how we qualify the uh, lead structure for transition to early clinical trials. My background uh, is in uh, cancer drug discovery and development, having served for many years as uh, head of NCI's developmental therapeutics program uh, prior to my current faculty role. So while there will be other lectures in the series that will potentially uh, drill down into different aspects of these uh, targets. Today's lectures are going, lecture is going to focus uh, on an overview of uh, the process. So historically, drug discovery, at least I, from my point of view, is a succession of styles that have been brought to bear as to defining uh, new agents for clinical use. Throughout history until the middle part of the last century, these were generally driven by mixtures of uh, natural products or even folk remedies, potentially uh, qualified in bioassays uh, that uh, defined uh, activity of the agent in a biological system that might be therapeutically relevant. Examples of this might include digitalis, the Rao Wolfia alkaloids for hypertension, familiar penicillins uh, as anti infectives, and even as uh, from a cancer perspective, uh, natural products that gave us anthracyclines, vinca alkaloids, and others. From the 1930s to the present time, there has been an increasing emphasis in the use of pure compounds uh, or collections of pure compounds, again using a bioassay of some type to define activity in a preclinical sense. Examples of these would include uh, sulfa drugs, many diuretics, first generation hypoglycemics and antihypertensive medications. From the 1960s to the present, uh, the use of pure compounds against purified uh, enzymes in particular or purified macromolecules uh, that might represent the drug target generated ACE inhibitors, the cholesterol lowering statins, uh, and more recently reverse transcriptase and protease inhibitors as anti-HIV agents. And more recently, there has been an increasing focus on bringing combinatorial methods to bring mixtures of compounds actually as uh, the basis of a screen, potentially against uh, many targets. This process uh, has historically been viewed as relatively inefficient and unfortunately, from many points of view, remains that way. The reason why compounds fail or slow down in their development include uh, toxicity that becomes appreciated in a uh, large animal or uh, even uh, first emerging in early clinical trials. And uh, in this regard, ambiguities in toxicology studies are a basis uh, for reconsideration of a molecular uh, lead. Uh, 
lack of efficacy ultimately for the goal uh, uh, in, that is intended. Uh, and this may come from low potency uh, or failure uh, of a molecule to have appropriate selectivity. Uh, market reasons, that is to say considerations why what might be a good idea scientifically doesn't quite turn out to be practical may relate to synthetic complexity. The relatively time sensitivity of an indication with emergence of competing products uh, considered uh, better ideas even though a prior molecule may be very far, far along in its development. Prominent, however, remains poor biopharmaceutical properties where the compound may be very active in vitro or in a dish but ultimately perform poorly in humans uh, remains uh, a very uh, also prominent basis for potential uh, difficulties. So if one wants to look at a roadmap, so to speak, of drug discovery, if one considers um, many screens that examine many compounds, again across a number of uh, potential therapeutic areas, uh, there are thousands of potential hits in these screens that typically are winnowed in the preclinical screening process to a smaller number of uh, lead compounds of which a uh, fraction ultimately emerge as drug candidates to enter preclinical development and then proceed on to phase one, phase two, and phase three trials leading to a single drug candidate to emerge as an approved uh, candidate. And the basis for winnowing and how to qualify drugs is a matter that we will consider uh, in uh, this lecture and in others in this series. So how do we define drug targets that may be relevant to the uh, uh, bringing uh, molecules forward that would be relevant to a disease? There are two contrasting, if you will, drug discovery philosophies. Um, as might be apparent from the, my uh, historical overview, a so-called empirical process whereby one in recognizes the initial drug lead by a functionally useful effect did dominate uh, the landscape uh, until the middle of the last century uh, and indeed up until close to the current one. Examples would be penicillin being found by their antibacterial effect famously with uh, Dr. Fleming's uh, bacterial clearing action. Uh, Rao Wolfius had antihypertensive in, uh, effects in model systems and in uh, cancer, of course, anti-tumor activity of extracts ultimately defined uh, the activity of, for example, Taxol. Uh, as I mentioned, digoxin uh, ultimately derived from the use in folk medicine of uh, foxglove to treat uh, the uh, dropsy. The problem, of course, is that any empirical approach uh, really is potentially quite divorced from the biochemistry and biology uh, that ultimately is responsible for clinical value. In the past uh, generation, the emergence of rational drug discovery uh, themes and approaches are uh, driven by the desire to recognize a value uh, of a drug or a valuable structure, either by de novo design, understanding the molecular structure of the relevant target, or screening against a very precise uh, process that uh, has a critical uh, target to the pathophysiology of the, uh, of the disease and which is a putative uh, target for the drug's action. Examples of these that have been successful have been the emergence of HIV protease inhibitors uh, where the initial uh, target really wasn't defined until relatively late in the last century and within a relatively short period of time, this has changed the landscape in that uh, disease. And even in, for example, anti-tumor uh, uh, activity, methotrexate emerged from a very considered understanding of the importance of folates in uh, cellular metabolism. And so for its uh, day, it was certainly a basis of a rational uh, drug uh, candidate uh, for rationally derived drug candidate against uh, cancer. In this case, how to recognize the most disease relevant targets is uh, the key aspect in designing a screening for a rational drug discovery program. 
So if one looks at the cancer perspective, which is what I have most personal experience, um, one can derive potential uh, molecularly targeted approaches of value uh, fundamentally by considering uh, biology, uh, which in the uh, cancer arena is uh, given by clues from the uh, cancer cells, cytogenetics leading to breakpoints, leading to specific molecules such as BCR able that we'll consider in uh, a little bit greater detail later. Positive selection from tumor DNA to define so-called active oncogenes, which derive tumors, which drive tumors in model systems. Uh, tumor gene expression profiling and siRNA, for example, induced modulation of a phenotype can pinpoint quite precise uh, targets that are of potential value in this arena. One can certainly try and retrofit active molecules known to be anti-proliferative by defining the binding partners of uh, the molecules, and these then become a potential basis uh, for uh, developing screening strategies. Important uh, in this effort has been the development of computational uh, algorithms, uh, which one uh, tries to link the activity of a molecule to bind to a particular target uh, as a basis for assisting in this effort. I alluded to uh, the relative success uh, with the antifolate structures, and these could be considered a classical uh, use of uh, a knowledge of cellular metabolism or biochemistry to suggest uh, important enzymes in uh, the uh, uh, progress of that metabolism and therefore allow screening against single targets. However, while it may be relatively inefficient as many targets select themselves, detailed medicinal chemistry is possible against these, uh, against these targets. And more recently, the, uh, the advent of chemical genetics using libraries of molecules against uh, precisely defined, in some cases, organisms or cell types uh, is a way of greatly increasing the efficiency with which lead structures can be tied to particular uh, uh, molecules. One example uh, that uh, was sponsored uh, by uh, NIH uh, and which has been uh, highly uh, used in uh, the cancer drug discovery process was presaged by uh, the Cancer Genome Anatomy Project where archival tumor material was the basis for microdissection of tumor cells from defined section to create cDNA libraries, and these can be sequenced, uh, and then the results of those sequences with respect to the uh, sequence itself or the expression level of the relevant genes deposited in the public domain. And in this type of information data set, a given tumor uh, has a number of different uh, genes arrayed with some that are underexpressed in cancer cells or overexpressed in cancer cells, and clearly the ones that are overexpressed in the cancer cells are a basis for potentially developing a strategy to direct that particular type of uh, a cancer to a drug. And uh, these can be uh, searched through, uh, for example, uh, the NIH website uh, mentioned here, but now there are numerous uh, public uh, and private agencies that have collections of gene expression data that is a basis uh, for uh, defining potential candidates relevant to drug discovery and a relevant website is again shown here. So another uh, basis uh, for uh, defining relevant targets is to take active molecules and then to define, for example, the basis uh, of that activity by looking for the binding partner of uh, that entity in the relevant cell types. So this is a benzoquinoid uh, ansomycin exemplified by gildanomycin which has a relatively unique ring structure that is shown here, uh, linked to a benzoquinone. And uh, this is produced by uh, a number of bacterial species and was found to have anti-proliferative activity in empirical screens. However, what was uh, most interesting uh, was the observation that these compounds could uh, adopt the phenotype of so-called reversing uh, aspects of a transformation driven by oncogenes in a variety of model systems. And colleagues in Japan uh, defined the ability of this uh, class of molecules to decrease tyrosine phosphorylation of critical oncogene targets. Uh, however, uh, they really didn't inhibit the complex, uh, for example, kinase uh, 
immune complex kinase uh, directly, but the target was inhibited in drug-treated cells, and this actually led to the very early speculation uh, by Japanese investigators that somehow the intracellular environment of uh, the uh, target was uh, being altered. Uh, working uh, at the NCI, Len Neckers and colleagues in the early uh, 1990s, uh, using a knowledge of the pharmacology of active species, derivatized uh, the uh, structure to produce a solid phase uh, derivative that when incubated uh, with uh, tumor cells or even non-tumor uh, extracts, defined the existence of an approximately 90 kilodalton protein that was bound uh, by the galdanomycin, competed by excess non-bead-bound galdanomycin, uh, not competed by an inactive derivative, uh, and of course, uh, didn't had the bead themselves didn't recognize this. On characterization of this entity, uh, it became apparent that the target of the drug was not the kinase, but actually the heat shock protein 90, which was critically involved in the normal maturation of uh, the onco uh, oncoprotein uh, product, and the basis for uh, the apparent reversion of the transformed phenotype was the inability to produce an active, properly folded uh, oncoprotein. HSP90 is also recognized to have a critical chaperone role for a number of um, other uh, molecules, such as steroid hormone receptors, and exemplifies uh, the need to deconvolute uh, the uh, uh, role of uh, molecules that appear to have an effect in complex cellular systems uh, to understand their potential basis uh, for uh, drug activity. So once you have a particular target in mind, how do you actually attempt to generate diversity in uh, the molecules that are considered to screen for active agents that might be relevant uh, to the target? Uh, if one is in an empirical drug discovery arena, or even if one has purified products that would be active in a bioassay, a historically important source of, natural, of diversity is so-called natural products. The term refu refers to entities derived from plants, animals, bacteria, uh, may even have uh, the use of so-called ethnopharmacognosy uh, to suggest uh, use. You could have pure compound collections, but more frequently these are extracts, either aqueous or organic, uh, and one can uh, look for biologically interesting uh, enrichment of such extracts by using producer organisms that have been engineered to uh, augment uh, the useful effect. Um, and this would be one source of diversity. One can also have uh, compound libraries, either peptide or non-peptide, or you can have uh, target-derived libraries that are uh, uh, folded into or considering uh, the structural characteristics of uh, the relevant target that you are uh, considered. These may be actually lead structures that have emerged from uh, theoretical docking of uh, chemical structures defined uh, by their molecular features, again, into structural um, uh, uh, information of the target. Returning to natural products, uh, approximately a quarter to a third uh, of all uh, drugs, uh, at least as uh, by the turn of the century, did ultimately derive from actual uh, natural product uh, uh, initial um, extracts or were synthet synthetic derivatives therefrom. An example uh, is shown here, uh, uh, Taxol, uh, which is uh, derived from the Pacific yew tree, uh, is of interest because natural product scaffolds contain uh, the, um, a diversity of precise orientation of acidic, basic, uh, aqueous, and, uh, in, and organic uh, functional groups in space, and these therefore have a basis for having extremely selective binding features uh, to, uh, to target molecules. Uh, an example of uh, ethnopharmacognosy is provided by actually lidocaine, the uh, currently used anesthetic, uh, which uh, ultimately came to attention by the observation that certain camels didn't like to eat 
a certain type of read. And this led to the characterization of this structure, gramine, as the, if you will, antifedant principle in uh, the uh, grain. And this led to this synthesis of isogramine, which had uh, on uh, taste tests in humans abundant numbness, which then uh, led to the uh, production of uh, lidocaine, which is used clinically to this date. Problems with natural production, of course, is that you have to deconvolute from the mixture uh, pure compounds uh, that uh, allow a precise definition of the biologic effect. Uh, there is much interest, and there continues to be interest, in uh, complementary and alternative medicine strategies in various diseases to actually use uh, the originating uh, natural product extracts, uh, but a continuing problem is the definition uh, of the basis uh, for potency and activity in extracts. And therefore, uh, there is, uh, if they're going to be practically useful, they uh, generally have to result in pure compounds as a basis uh, for uh, biologic effect. So turning to uh, chemical compound uh, libraries, the uh, potential value of uh, compound collections that are cons constructed according to precise uh, algorithms uh, can, be ca can be exemplified by considering uh, a, um, a simple tripeptide uh, that will consider we can put four different amino acids in each of the positions. Uh, therefore, there are 64 potential uh, peptides that would emerge uh, if we were to select, for example, alanine, arginine, threonine, and tryptophan. And um, one can see that by increasing the length of the peptide, uh, one can, uh, and considering additional uh, uh, examples from the naturally occurring amino acids, that very soon one has a huge number of potential uh, precise molecular entities, all of which uh, represent uh, the variation of uh, amino acids at that position. In using such peptides to screen, uh, one runs into the practical problems of how um, dilute, so to speak, a single molecule can be, and yet still ex expect to see a useful signal. Consider a peptide that has activity uh, in an assay uh, with an IC50 of uh, one uh, nanomolar. Uh, it becomes apparent that you really can't get much more than 10,000 entities before you push it to a activity, if that's the only active uh, principle, of uh, between 10 to the minus fourth and 10 to the minus fifth molar, which is about where you're going to start running into solubility uh, problems. So most uh, mixtures of uh, free peptides um, are pretty much uh, capped in their usefulness at about 10,000 members. Different approaches to this, uh, which uh, can be potentially discussed in other lectures in the series, are to use solid phase or other strategies uh, to have uh, uh, ways of having, in essence, more uh, than uh, 10,000 members in the mixture. So combinatorial libraries, if you were going to compare them to natural product extracts as a source of diversity, there are pros and cons. While definitely both can have uh, allowed direct screening of compound mixtures, uh, and both can allow the discovery of very active compounds, the problem with extracts is that by definition, extract to extract is going to vary with respect to uh, concentrations of compounds. There's going to be a relative uh, lack of understanding of the chemical structures that are possible or the synthetic pathways that would be relevant to deconvoluting or working on an active agent. And um, it's going to be rather difficult to interpret from the data a structure activity relationship. Whereas synthetic combinatorial mixtures uh, are potentially going to be informative in each of those areas, even at the screening stage. It's certainly possible, and schemes have been defined, to produce non-peptide combinatorial strategies where the different substituents arise around a common scaffold or backbone, as uh, exemplified uh, here. And in this uh, capacity, uh, it, one commonly apply, uh, applies different rules in constructing the molecules to maximize the potential value uh, 
of the outcome as a, as a, as a bona fide candidate. Uh, among the common algorithms are the so-called rule of five that uh, compounds with two or more of the following uh, properties around H-bond donors, molecular weight, uh, oil to water coefficient, and uh, some of uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen uh, subunits uh, are flagged as likely to have poor oral absorption if it is viewed uh, that the successful drug candidate would require uh, frequent uh, administration. Uh, and uh, this allows one to substitute or select um, uh, side groups uh, that are, are valuable in that regard. So as an example of how uh, one applies uh, these types of um, uh, mixtures, you can make start out with peptides, undergo chemistry to convert them into non-peptide molecules that have uh, side chains, for example, R1, R2, R3 in this series, and uh, within a relatively uh, small number of candidate side groups, derive uh, hundreds of thousands of compounds for screening. Uh, and um, then one can use uh, these uh, molecules in different uh, bioassays uh, against soluble acceptors, membrane-bound receptors. One could use them as screening uh, to, in, with live organisms or look for effects on different cellular functions. And one can fairly rapidly define uh, uh, positions R1, R2, and R3 that have uh, more or less, in this case, of binding to a particular uh, target substrate, and then uh, iterate the screen to select molecules that have the most effective binders to hopefully derive molecules with increased affinity uh, for the target. So turning to uh, the next um, uh, aspect of drug discovery, once you have lead structures, which we'll define as a pure compound or compound series, how do you actually uh, begin to try and qualify for uh, subsequent development these uh, lead structures? And uh, here, uh, there are uh, a number of uh, ways of uh, looking at devising uh, drug screens to apply to molecule connection, collections. If you choose, for example, a pure target screen, such as a biochemical screen, uh, binding or functional or even structural, uh, the advantage is that the binding becomes in and of itself, or the functional uh, success, at the definition of a so-called hit. Uh, the disadvantage is that one is looking at molecules that are acting outside of a cellular, biochemical, and ultimately organismic context. And therefore, you run the risk that something that looks very good uh, in a uh, structural or functional aspect is going to perform poorly uh, in the uh, cellular milieu. One can use a cell or even organism-based uh, uh, readout. The advantage, uh, hearkening back to the empirical observations, is that the readout occurs in a living system, something that, uh, if you observe an interesting enough uh, effect, becomes worthy of pursuit uh, in its own regard. The disadvantage, as we saw from, for example, the gildanomycin example, is that you ultimately must deconvolute the mechanism if one is going to optimize uh, compounds against a particular relevant target. And you also run the risk that you may actually have a combination of different targets that become uh, relevant uh, and that uh, having the activity disappear as you further deconvolute the mechanism is certainly something that can happen in this, uh, in this regard. Let's take an example. Tyrosine kinases, uh, clearly an important uh, target in uh, many uh, cancer-related indications, emerged from the fact that various tyrosine kinases are overexpressed or activated in cancer. Um, these can be activated by mutation or translocation, and in a variety of contexts, these have been defined with advanced stage or an inferior uh, prognosis. The proposed enzymatic mechanism for uh, tyrosine kinases is rather similar. The enzyme uh, ultimately makes labile a phosphate group at the end of an ATP in the context of an acceptor uh, tyrosine. And so as a uh, potential target, it's relatively uh, straightforward. 
So if you look at the initial molecules that were considered as potentially uh, relevant to this uh, transition state, uh, a number of things that kind of sort of looked like uh, tyrosine, uh, if one could imagine, for example, in this uh, lavendustin based advantage emerged in uh, screens of uh, either natural product collections or uh, pure compounds. If one considers the initial application of, uh, attempted application of these molecules uh, to a highly relevant clinical target, the B-seriable fusion protein, which emerges from the linking of sequences uh, from one chromosome uh, to a kinase on uh, a distinct chromosome to produce uh, the 1122 translocation that is important in the pathogenesis of chronic myelogenous leukemia. These initial tyrophosphines uh, certainly did have evidence of activity in inhibiting directly in complex uh, kinase assays the BCR able uh, oncoprotein uh, kinase function. However, um, they were very difficult to develop from a pharmacologic uh, perspective, um, and that uh, both uh, AG957, herbstatin, examples of such molecules basically didn't have useful activity uh, in vivo. Subsequent refinement of this structure by considering in particular uh, molecules uh, that had some basis for binding to other kinases uh, con that uh, were available to, uh, from a structural standpoint led to the definition of this molecule here, initially called STI-571, uh, which was a second generation uh, synthetic species directed against bcr able And in models uh, that were relevant to leukemia, it had the property of decreasing the phosphorylation of the target bcr able protein in tumor cells uh, in tumors in animals when either given in by the intraperitoneal or oral route. If one looked at animals afflicted uh, with tumors that had the bcr able target uh, protein, these animals survived uh, in contrast to uh, animals bearing tumors that did not have uh, the bcr able uh, target sequence, and therefore this was an argument for the specificity of this agent against the bcr able uh, target. And uh, this led to an initial experience in humans, which was highly rewarding. It's one of the few examples where a phase one trial was used as a basis for ultimately drug approval, uh, where many patients experienced an improvement in white blood cell count, and uh, many patients had disappearance of that translocation chromosome uh, within uh, several months of treatment with an oral pill. And this led to the approval of imatinib uh, after an initial uh, report of the clinical experience. And a phase three trial of imatinib as a single agent clearly showed value when compared to uh, the combination chemotherapy that was considered standard for the time and is a poster child, so to speak, of lining up a molecule with a target that's relevant to the biology of uh, the disease. However, unfortunately, in a minority of patients, there was not a good response, or there was the emergence of growth of uh, the uh, leukemia uh, as a function of time. Um, and this was heralded by the so-called glass crisis that it can occur in patients uh, treated uh, with uh, the imatinib, as well as emerging after other treatments. And when uh, this was sought to be understood, it became apparent that the wild-type kinase had a binding pocket that could uh, easily accept imatinib, but a number of resistant variants, exemplified uh, here uh, by the uh, so-called threonine 315 isoleucine uh, mutant, um, it didn't basically fit into the binding pocket and was a potential basis for its, not, for its lack of value directed against uh, the uh, leukemia. On the other hand, that became the basis for screening campaigns to derive subsequent derivatives, and in this case, desatinib, uh, which has activity against many, but not all, of the resistant uh, mutants, uh, went on to be an improved agent and is exemplary of where drug resistance, as defined in molecular terms, can be a basis for screening additional um, uh, useful uh, molecules.
A uh, second case uh, in terms of uh, screening is to use uh, so-called interfering RNA technology in cell-based screening to develop synthetic lethal drugs. Synthetic lethality refers to the concept that arises in Drosophila genetics, where the loss of one gene may be tolerated uh, owing to an over-reliance on another gene's function in a redundant or partially overlapping pathway. Synthetic lethality occurs when the gene from the redundant pathway it also is mutated or becomes inhibited, potentially by a drug. Deletion of neither gene alone is lethal, but together the organism cannot survive. This uh, state is potentially important in uh, tumors uh, where tumor suppressor genes uh, are proposed to induce a state of dependence on genes replacing their functions, and therefore looking for inhibitors of the second gene would be potentially valuable in the clinical context of cells bearing uh, the mutated suppressor gene. An example where this uh, has been uh, utilized in designing drug screens derived uh, from the knowledge that the enzyme poly-ADP ribose polymerase contributes to successful DNA repair pathways in a variety of contexts. The breast cancer-associated tumor suppressor gene 1, uh, abbreviated BRCA1 and BRCA2, are tumor suppressor genes responsible for familial breast and ovarian cancers, as well as a subset of so-called sporadic tumors in these organs. Uh, these are important for a particular DNA repair pathway called homologous recombination. Preclinical studies suggest that, that BRCA defective uh, cells were very sensitive to PARP inhibition uh, by uh, relatively uh, non-potent compounds. This raised the possibility that better PARP inhibitors would be synthetic lethal with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutated tumors. And therefore, this uh, allowed the design of a uh, synth synthetic, uh, uh, so-called uh, interfering uh, RNA screen to define novel PARP inhibitors. So uh, synthetic uh, or interfering RNA screening utilizes uh, short RNAs that uh, activate degradation of target RNA splice systems through the interfering RNA system active in a wide variety of uh, cellular types. One can precisely eliminate a target RNA, uh, and this allows uh, the cells that are resulting to be a basis for identifying new targets to develop screens, looking for compounds that are active more in the context of the deleted RNA, and that's what we're, we're going to focus on. And they have other uses that can either uh, uh, be allow target validation or uh, modifiers of uh, cytotoxics. And uh, what was done was to create uh, panels of cells that have independent ways of knocking out BRCA1 or BRCA2. And uh, these cells could be screened against compounds looking for a phenotype of greater activity in the knocked out cells than in the control, uh, which did not have uh, loss of BRCA1 or BRCA2. And what emerged was a series of compounds uh, that had uh, abundant uh, activity against poly-ADP ribose uh, polymerase and uh, have gone on in early clinical trials uh, to have abundant activity in patients, in this case uh, with uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutated ovarian cancer, and uh, these drugs have recently been uh, uh, approved for use uh, in those clinical conditions. Of great interest is the fact that other results from these uh, PARP inhibitor screening indicated that the same compounds had potential uh, activity in different contexts in a variety of different DNA repair pathways, implying that a certain bracha uh, might allow their activity, uh, and how we define that is now very much an area of interest in clinical oncology and may reveal other ways uh, to use uh, these compounds. Another case uh, of uh, devising uh, screens that are informative in uh, advancing the cause of the series are uh, the CD25 uh, phosphatases. These phosphatases are overexpressed in many cultured cancer cells. Uh, they suppress uh, cell death and overexpression of uh, the phosphatase 
has been detected in a variety of different cancers. It's also to show that they can formally qualify as an oncogene by cooperating uh, with uh, RAS uh, alleles in, uh, in causing focus formation in certain cellular backgrounds, uh, particularly those that uh, lacked RB. And the role of this uh, phosphatase is to convert uh, cyclin-dependent kinases from an inactive state to an active state and thus promote uh, cellular division. So a method uh, was uh, designed uh, by Lazo and colleagues to identify CDC25 uh, phosphatase inhibitors uh, by partially expressing uh, the target protein using a fluorescinated de derivative that when the phosphate rem is removed, the fluorescence is, um, is augmented. And this allowed uh, the definition of a series of uh, molecules that again all had a range of uh, quinone structures uh, that could act as potential CDC25 phosphatase inhibitors. So in qualifying compounds for potential uh, development, uh, an important uh, step is to so-called develop counter screens to use, for example, a other phosphatases and define those that are most inhibitory against the target as opposed to uh, other uh, phosphatases. Uh, one can then use engineered cells to validate uh, the target, and in this capacity, uh, a temperature-sensitive uh, uh, system of, uh, s that employed a mutant CDK that uh, at the non-permissive temperature showed no functional CDK activity, and what this allowed is uh, the definition that compound 5, by inhibiting phosphatase, um, does cause uh, G2M arrest, uh, therefore preventing, indicating that it, that it was inhibiting the phosphatase and therefore uh, preventing uh, the arrest uh, from occurring. And uh, this, therefore, defined that in the cellular system, this molecule was acting uh, as uh, anticipated. More recently, Structure-based design uh, approaches have become of great interest in defining lead structures. Uh, this can uh, usually come from two different routes. One can uh, have a protein that one can crystallize in the presence of the drug and therefore uh, define from the resulting structure uh, the potential relevance of the drug target. Uh, another approach is to use NMR spectroscopy to define fragments of molecules with affinity for the target. Of great interest uh, is uh, computational data that defines potential binding pockets on the surface of uh, different molecules, here shown uh, for the RAS oncoprotein. One can therefore uh, look at putative uh, molecules that dock into the binding uh, pocket through computerized approaches to therefore provide a basis of leads to then move to uh, a biological screening system. And uh, this can also be done to reveal different ligand com conformations, such as, for example, uh, targeting the ATP binding uh, pocket of uh, SARC kinase. NMR-based screening uh, looks for fragment-like molecules with lead-like properties, generally small fragments, that uh, bind to a portion of the molecule in, uh, of interest. Uh, ligands uh, can be, uh, uh, with uh, weak affinities, can be recognized by this technique, and that's an, actually at some levels an advantage. And then one can therefore pick a higher affinity binding through iterative screening. Interestingly, by, uh, by labeling the protein of interest with different isotopes of different sensitivity uh, to uh, NMR, uh, based screening, you can define the locus of binding uh, by effects on uh, the uh, uh, molecule's binding parameters. So NMR has long been known as a way of defining binding sites. Uh, this is an example uh, from uh, the older literature that shows the, uh, the well-known antibiotic bleomycin, which binds to DNA. Uh, in the bound state, there is a suppression of signals emerging from these methyl groups, and that's the basis for defining uh, that portion of the molecule as interacting with, in that case, DNA. So using NMR fragment-based screening takes that further uh, 
by uh, understanding that the target of interest uh, has uh, potential pockets that if you have in the presence of, of uh, one lead that binds here, uh, a s evidence of an interaction, and a presence of another lead that binds here, uh, evidence of a distinct interaction. Uh, when one puts together uh, these two binding fragments, if one remembers the mul multiplicative uh, properties of binding constants from general chemistry, you can get a powerful augmentation of binding to allow uh, definition of a more potent uh, binding constant. In a recent uh, series of molecules that was studies that looked at the anti-apoptotic protein BCLXL, NMR uh, binding properties were used uh, to see a, um, a range of, um, uh, of affinities that ultimately uh, resulted in the definition of a compound that had uh, the ability to uh, bind to the relevant uh, target areas as defined by chemical shift from labeled protein of N15 versus um, uh, regularly protonated uh, substances. And this uh, led to a uh, evidence that each fragment was binding to its appropriate pocket, linking these uh, molecules then related in, in a series that has recently led to an approved drug for um, the treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So to conclude uh, the uh, discussion, having defined uh, a lead structure that is potentially qualified for transition to clinical trials, uh, what are the steps that are conventionally undertaken? Um, again, reflecting my um, primary background in the cancer sphere, uh, one wants to then uh, look for evidence of activity in animal models of cancer, but this could be animal models of any relevant disease, and then importantly relate the activity or lack thereof in animal models to the concentrations and durations of drug exposure, that is to the pharmacology of the agent, which is uh, the focus of many other aspects of this course. Um, and an example uh, here, uh, a series of benzoyl phenylureas that had anti-proliferative activity and were recognized as anti-tubulin binding agents, uh, was, was uh, studied uh, by NCI, and many members of the series had active in a activity in a variety of cell lines, shown here as inhibiting cell growth as a function of concentration. Um, when these were studied in human tumor xenografts, there was evidence of a activity in a variety of cellular models uh, given by intraperitoneal or oral roots. Uh, importantly, uh, molecules differed with respect to the concentration uh, that was achieved in uh, different degrees of methylation in the series uh, with the um, monomethylated and dimethylated having uh, shorter exposures uh, than uh, the other member of the series. And that uh, pointed to the benzoyl phenylurea uh, compound that was advanced to clinical trials. One then defines in animals a safe starting dose, uh, which conventionally uh, looks at, uh, in the case of drugs, two species, one rodent and non-rodent, according to a clinical route and schedule that's relevant, and uh, incorporating information from pharmacokinetics where possible. Biologicals follow a somewhat different route in that a single most relevant species is uh, undertaken, again, adhering to the clinical route and schedule. Returning to our benzoylphenylurea, uh, in, uh, studied in rats and dogs on a schedule that would support either twice weekly or once weekly uh, administration in humans, it was possible to define maximum tolerated doses as shown here, and uh, dose limiting toxicity in each case uh, was uh, bone marrow and gastrointestinal tract dysfunction. And conventionally, one-sixth to one-tenth of the dose uh, in the most sensitive species uh, allows uh, inception of human clinical trials, in this case, 24 milligram per meter squared as the initial dose. The problem, however, with maximum tolerated dose-driven endpoints is that many of the drugs that are uh, important in oncogenesis and in many other physiologic processes are effective by combining with high affinity binding sites. Therefore, using toxicity as the basis of 
uh, advancing a uh, drug class uh, is problematic, particularly in non-cancer uh, related uh, uh, contexts. Whether dosing beyond the effect on the desired uh, target buys any value is uh, obviously not clear. Therefore, a great deal of interest exists in preclinical studies to define a biologically effective dose as opposed to, or at least in parallel with, a maximum tolerated dose using this biologic rather than toxic endpoints in early phase one studies. Another way to think of this is that if one is pursuing a rational drug discovery scheme where one has uh, knowledge ahead of time of the target and of the presence and importance of the target in the biological model of the disease, one can tailor both the toxicology and the ultimate uh, human development path uh, by affecting the target at every step along the way. An example of where this was an important contribution, even in the cancer sphere, is provided by the 20S proteasome inhibitors, uh, boronic acids. These uh, were received by NCI as a series of compounds with potential antiproliferative agent. Um, and uh, what you can see is that uh, the most potent members of the series, in this case PS341, or one of the more potent ones, had a great degree of correlation of activity uh, as a proteasome inhibitor, uh, along with uh, in the ability to inhibit uh, cell growth. So-called PS341 uh, emerged as a uh, convenient lead structure in terms of synthetic properties. It had evidence of in, in vivo activity in a variety of tumor types uh, with uh, animals treated between 0 0.3 and 1 mil milligram per kilogram manifesting evidence of useful anti-tumor activity potentially. When this was correlated with the activity on the uh, proteasome, both in a surrogate tissue, uh, white blood cells, as well as in the tumor tissue, it was apparent that those doses that uh, uh, portended activity was associated with an about an 80% inhibition of uh, the proteasome activity in peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells. This led to the development of an assay for proteasome uh, activity that uh, guided uh, the, uh, the drug dose escalation, and that was predicated on the fact that when one looked at a series of uh, toxicology studies in um, different species, including non-human primates, although there was a, uh, a 10 to 20-fold variation in uh, the dose uh, that uh, uh, was uh, productive of a very common uh, degree of, um, of proteasome inhibition, this suggested that escalation of dose beyond this 70 to 80 percent proteasome inhibity, inhibition uh, is a basis for uh, calling an uh, end to dose escalation uh, because, as you can see, going from 0 0.8 to 3, uh, you're not getting any more effect on the relevant target where there is uh, potentially a uh, basis uh, for toxicity. This uh, led to an initial clinical experience uh, where uh, one escalated only to the occurrence of about uh, uh, 70 to 80 percent inhibition, and this was accomplished uh, uh, by pooling data from a number of different uh, clinical sites. and. Uh, Right about here uh, is where there was first evidence of valuable activity in patients uh, with multiple myeloma was observed, and that led to uh, ultimately uh, a development strategy uh, for what we now know as bortezomib as an index uh, proteasome inhibitor of great value to patients with that disorder. So to summarize, drug discovery is a sequence of preclinical studies ranging from uh, very early uh, recognition of lead structures, uh, their uh, potential activity in uh, models of the disease of interest, uh, and then an optimization of uh, those structures uh, by a variety of techniques ranging from fairly um, classical um, uh, medicinal chemistry to uh, modern uh, molecularly uh, assisted uh, screens and uh, ways of qualifying uh, molecules uh, 
but all of these studies uh, in the drug discovery process have the goal of aiding and promoting uh, clinical trials and assuring the likely safety of the initially explored regimen. Uh, certainly provides a scientific basis for assessing the clinical effects of the agent. And there is going to be an increasing focus on correlating the molecular effects of these agents on the intended targets, along with the more us usual pharmacologic and toxicologic endpoints uh, to refine and minimize, hopefully, the risk of uh, failure of the agent uh, in uh, clinical trials. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope this presentation was valuable in describing the process of uh, drug discovery. If you have any questions concerning uh, the presentation, please contact the coordinator of the course, and thank you and have a good day.